if I were to present you the argument, I think that third parties are going to pick up a more significant portion of the vote this election because unfavorability ratings are extremely high. 40% of Americans are independent and the splits within the major parties, do you immediately think not so fast? It's not, it's not clear at all. Like it seems like they could get tons of publicity and people could just say this is too important an election and I want to vote for, um, you know, one of the major candidates. And that's usually what happens. Okay. Um, but of course, from the third party point of view, I think this is, a, of course, a good time for them to roll the dice and, and try their best. In 2016, third candidates did get tons of publicity. In fact, 10 times as much as 2012. But when compared to the major candidates, does it even matter? Who would choose to take on those odds? Why? This is episode four, Mean Reversion. Did you watch Game of Thrones? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It was the last episode, the best episode ever. Jon Snow was gonna go down. Oh man, I just got the, I thought this is the end. Oh, here we go. How are you, young man? How are you? How are you doing? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Oh, that's right. Well, I better jot down a stump speech. That's what I think. This little speech here and the one on Saturday will be the same as will 48 more following that will be the same. Are there 48 on the books right now? Not on the books, no. But I guarantee you there will be 48 on them. In June, Gary Johnson became the first libertarian candidate to ever participate in a live presidential forum on a major news network. A rare moment where an outsider ticket gets to talk about policies to millions of Americans. The Libertarian Party may be the new party on your radar, but you should know they were the first to hold its convention, make its choice, and is now working hard right now to get on the ballot in all 50 states. So can the Libertarians provide better answers than what you've heard so far? Joining us now is the Libertarian presidential nominee, Governor Gary Johnson from New Mexico, and his running mate, Governor William Weld from Massachusetts. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Well, what an opportunity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jill Stein's coming out party was a little less formal. Bernie, Bernie, Bernie Sanders supporters, angry at how the Democratic Party had treated their candidate, were not immediately buying into party unity, presenting Jill Stein with an opportunity. I stand here as a Washington State delegate, and I'm standing with Dr. Joe Stein, the Green Party candidate for president. And I absolutely must say, I'm incredibly starstruck and very honored <laughs> that you're here. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, and I'll just say continue your work, and remember that we are here as Plan B for Bernie. We've seen how far a revolutionary campaign can get inside of a counter-revolutionary party. Again, thank you so much for being on. I really am awestruck, but I know you got to go through what you're around. I don't understand why he gave in so quickly. So we all feel like we're responsible for what happens to the movement. We have our work cut out for us, but anyway, that's she's the progressive. Because of her similar platform, Jill found herself in a position to recruit disenfranchised Bernie supporters, grassroots activists, and siphon off some media attention from the main event. When you're a third party candidate, you sit down at somewhere in you know, December and you think, all right, how am I gonna be getting to 5%? Everybody has come to watch this sideshow, this circus. So you come in here, you, know, you get out in front of it, and you start messaging. 
but I don't want to be the spoiler. I want to change the environment and the dialogue of the conversation. So I got to get to 10. Through the summer, interest remains stronger than usual for third parties, but it never breaks one of the most important milestones needed to establish viability moving into the fall, the 15% threshold needed to get an invite to the debates. As a way to explain a drop in third party support, many people will point to high profile media gaffes. And what is Aleppo? You're kidding. No. But. At an event the week of Aleppo, Gary told us that while the week had been hell and he was incredibly disappointed in himself, those were the biggest fundraising days in September. Despite the gaffes, his message still resonated with people and his supporters were still pushing hard for debate access. I feel like it's important for people to realize that there's a third candidate because most people don't. Like Gary debate, that's the biggest thing right now. I mean, there, there's so many issues that he brings up that are really important that people just don't want to listen or talk about or bring up, you know? And what do you think about uh, him getting 15% to get into the debates? Um, I mean, he should be in the debate. There's no question about it. it it's, he needs to be there. Debate access is a signal of viability to the American public one that separates a campaign from the 1,800 other people running for president. If a candidate is not in the debates, you are just another face in the crowd. There was already this, this sense that a lot of people were sitting it out. And I kept thinking, there are more choices than this. Mm -hmm. and, and so I looked into it. Well, I was surprised to see that the FEC had, at the time, over 500 registered candidates to mm -hmm. run for president of the United States. Some of them were probably guys wearing foil hats, mm -hmm. but, but there were some that were serious, seriously qualified people. I think as you listen to all of us as independent candidates, we probably all got into this out of a sense of passion or outrage about something. For me, it was having worked inside the federal government for 32 years, including six, six and a half years in the White House partnership to reinvent government. For me, the outrage was about hundreds of billions of dollars of waste inside government agencies. Uh, the challenges of running as an independent candidate for president. Yes. So um, I'd say the first one is <laughs> that people don't actually know that they're independent candidates running yeah. for any office. Why are these kind of things so important in the grand scheme of this election? Well, here's why. Um, most Americans are not aware of the, um, the machine that is at work right now. This particular election cycle, if nothing else, is a learning experience for all of us. Trump, 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 Trump. Oh, Trump, 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 Trump. Friends of Trump, 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 and friends of Trump, Trump, Trump. Hillary, 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 Hillary. You repeat it enough, and people don't think there's anything else out there. While the independents in Flint celebrated their small bit of airtime with pizza and beer, the machine that was the Clinton campaign went to work to win back drifting voters. By mid-September, with debate invite announcements expected any day, Jill Stein, sitting well below the 15% threshold, knew one wasn't coming. Why was she still fighting? I do not have a personal stake in being the candidate or being the president, but I have an enormous personal stake as everyone does, I think, on this planet, of ensuring that we actually have a future. We have down ballot uh, candidates here, so why is your campaign specifically so important to uh, the Margaret Flowers of the world? So by running at a headliner level, we help bring attention and energy and volunteers and funding uh, to all the down ballot candidates. And there may be people who decide they're not gonna vote for a green president, but some of those people will vote uh, green down ballot. We've had uh, candidates at the local level, but people don't hear about them. They only hear about the Green Party when we're actually challenging power at the higher levels. So what we're doing here tonight and every day forward is we are building political power, and that's what the Green Party is about. Oh, wow, there's a line and everything. So cool. You want this back on, or I'll just hold on to it. Do I need it? Nah. 
back in the fall, uh, Dr. Jill Stein was here visiting in Baltimore for some interviews that she needed to do. And people found out and just said, hey, do we get to meet her while she's here in Baltimore? So I said, well, we'll just do a little informal meet and greet at our house. Literally announced it on Facebook one time the night before, and people started showing up the next day, half an hour before the event was supposed to start. We had a line out the door, and so many people came to my house that we had to kick everybody out and go to the backyard because that was the only way that we could accommodate everybody. And that really brought attention to my race as well as the race for our mayoral candidate because he was there. I think he said, power to the people. Power to the people. That's what I like. So my entire campaign is really about shifting the narrative the power away from bureaucracy of city hall and corporate entities into the hands of the people that are impacted most. I'd say running as a third party candidate is it's not easy. It's not the cool thing to do. It's great to have someone, particularly to have her support. This isn't the first time she's been to Baltimore. Uh, she came in to endorse my economic development platform and endorse my candidacy uh, several months back. She came in just a few weeks ago and went on a tour of the public housing projects in Baltimore City to really look at the conditions uh, of poverty in Baltimore City, knowing particularly that public housing is federally funded. Uh, and so we wanted to look at and have those conversations with individuals that live in those conditions every single day. In the face of police brutality, dance. In the face of transphobia, we dance. In the face of xenophobia, we dance. In the face of sexism, we dance. In the face of racism, we dance. Dance however you like. On the same day as the Baltimore rally, the Commission on Presidential Debates announced that only the Democratic and Republican candidates would be invited. This was a devastating blow to the third party campaigns. This is the free speech area over here. It's dead and empty. I mean, we're a mile away from where even getting into campus than the, the building where they're doing the debate is even, even further, further into there. Campus. And there's yeah. uh, just a massive show of force of police, of secret service, of public safety. And I went to go over out of the free speech cage onto the campus proper to meet this reporter who wanted to interview me on TV and I was told by the campus police that I couldn't go on campus. What the CPD wants to do by keeping him out is, is make people feel like it's hopeless. With the most anticipated television event of the year just hours away, none of those cameras were coming out of the campus compound unless there was a massive showing of support. Houston, those people are holding out their banners out in the streets, you know? I don't... I don't know where we, why aren't there more of us here? I mean, I invited people, but I gotta work and you know, it's too far to drive. My kids are worth it, ultimately, because I was never into politics before, not even a little bit. I've never had a voice like this. It's an arbitrary number and no one's questioning it. They just say he's not qualified because he didn't make some arbitrary number. I'm just disappointed, but I'm not done fighting. Ladies and gentlemen, you are obstructing vehicular traffic. If you refuse to move, you are subject to arrest. Charges will be lodged against you. If you do not comply, you will be arrested immediately. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, okay, so, you are obstructing So let me give you one more opportunity to go in the direction where free speech area is. If you continue to do it, just so you understand. We're no going to have to arrest everybody in the group. All right. The traffic. Just tell you. If you refuse to move, uh, you are subject to arrest. That, uh, he is going to arrest us. I am ordering you to immediately leave this roadway. Uh, that we're not we in the free so speech zone. The green protests made a small stir, but the barricades made them hard to find. There's nothing down here. Down that way? Any more protests down here? We had maybe, what, 25 libertarians at the free speech zone. Mm -hmm. We've run into a group of 25 Greens here. They say there was about three bus loads, so, what, 150? But, yeah, everyone's going home now. By the time the debate started, any remaining protests had moved closer to the entrance. <laughs> Great sign. Feeling good. You got the hashtag going and everything? Absolutely. Right on. Yeah. 
months before the election, people might toy with different candidates and say, well, maybe I'll vote for this guy, maybe I'll vote for her. But then when the election comes around, people typically revert back to what you would predict. It's Democrats voting for Democrats and Republicans voting for Republicans. They're pretty consistent patterns that you see over different elections. Right. So at any given day, you see the poll moving around, but it ends up in a certain place where it was going to end up. And as I said, that's a predeterministic you know, view of the world that's slightly extreme, um, but there's a lot of truth to that. As the race came to its closing days, the historical pattern of voters returning home was holding true. But the absolute numbers of those not returning did remain higher than normal. The level that you're pulling with the military, the level that you're pulling with millennials, that, that's unprecedented for you guys, right? This election's a pretty good election for us. When you combine these smaller victories, this incremental growth was some of the reform efforts we've seen through our series that aim to change the structure and the rules of our elections. What happens?